Hello, and welcome to the Tea Leaves Podcast, where our goal is to bring Asia to you through conversations with the people whose lives and work are shaping the Indo-Pacific. I'm Rexon Yu, Managing Partner at The Asia Group. And I'm Sherian, anchor for Bloomberg Television, Daybreak Asia and Daybreak Australia. Today, we are pleased to welcome to Tea Leaves a distinguished public servant and one of our nation's foremost national security leaders, former CIA Director John Brennan. John served as CIA Director from 2013 to 2017, following four years as Assistant to President Obama for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism a key decision maker on many of the country's most critical national security matters. John played a central role in efforts to counter international extremism, U.S. policy in Syria and the fight against ISIS, as well as the Iran deal. John also served six U.S. presidents and in 2003 became the founding director of the CIA Terrorist Threat Integration Center. Before his service to the Bush administration, Mr. Brennan was President Clinton's daily intelligence briefer and served in key intelligence roles in Washington and the Middle East. John, you spent countless hours around the table in the White House Situation Room, and I was privileged to share a few of those with you during President Obama's administration. And it's really good to welcome you back to a virtual table with Sherry and me. Uh, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Well, thank you, Rexon and Sherry. And thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, I look forward to the discussion. There's not a dearth of issues uh, to discuss these days. <laughs> John, I thought I'd start uh, on Afghanistan and maybe go back a bit. You had a career as a CIA official uh, more than two decades long, uh, beginning, I think you joined the service uh, around 1980. And um, in 2001, I think you mentioned to me, you were serving as, in effect, the deputy chief operating officer in the CIA on 9-11. Wanted to see if you might just spend a f- first few minutes just recounting what it was like in that role on 9-11 when the planes hit? Well, in the months leading up to 9-11, I think there was a a palpable sense within CIA that Al-Qaeda was going to carry out some type of very large attack against US interests, potentially even against the homeland. But unfortunately, we didn't have the tactical intelligence that would give us what they would do, where they would do it, and when. And so when those planes struck the World Trade Center on September 11th, uh, I think we immediately knew that this was Al-Qaeda's plan that had come to fruition, unfortunately, killing thousands of individuals. And so in the the minutes, in the hours, days, weeks, months afterward, I think there was a real sense within CIA that we had a responsibility to do everything possible to find out who the perpetrators were and whether or not there were other attacks planned. Then also to take the fight to Al-Qaeda and try to destroy the organization so that it could not carry out additional attacks. And so when I think back over the last 20 years, I'm very proud of what my colleagues at CIA, as well as other government agencies did to, again, bring justice to all those victims and their families uh, that uh, fell prey to al-Qaeda's um, um, hostile action on 9-11. And you were, of course, with President Obama when actually you went ahead and captured Al-Qaeda's leader, Osama bin Laden. How did that feel? Well, yeah, I was his assistant for counterterrorism in the White House. And about six months before the operation, the CIA had let us know that they were on the trail of uh, one of bin Laden's personal couriers, which was a very, very hopeful sign that we might, in fact, be able to find him. And so in those months leading up to the uh, Abbottabad raid. Um, uh, there was uh, so many meetings in the White House Situation Room where we discussed uh, the intelligence. Uh, we discussed the various options available to the president in terms of how to try to get bin Laden and then um, walk through the, the scenario that ultimately was decided upon, which was that helicopter assault uh, where you had very brave and courageous U.S. Special Operations Forces carry out that raid. But it was the CIA's work, uh, again, along with their other intelligence community brothers and sisters, uh, that uh, revealed where bin Laden had been hiding uh, for those uh, uh, several years, I think, before the actual raid took place. John, there's been a 
a huge amount of debate over the last number of months. You and I talked about it a couple of weeks ago around President Biden's decision to end the war in Afghanistan uh, for our military presence to depart and and a, a consequent set of debates uh, around what has unfolded uh, in the aftermath and in the course of our withdrawal. I, I want to ask you uh, a question from a more strategic angle, which is accepting the president's decision. How do you think about what the key strategic and geopolitical implications are for the United States? You've been through a number of consequential episodes in our history. And I, I'd love to have you put your hat back on for a minute and, and take us inside your perspective around what your framework would be for thinking about what the key policy questions are for the United States going forward. Well, I think I would look at it from the standpoint of concentric circles of implications. First, in Afghanistan, I think we are watching now what the Taliban is doing and whether or not uh, Al-Qaeda is going to be able to regenerate there, whether or not ISIS is going to be able to grow as well. And so right in that Afghan PAC area, I think there is great concern about the regeneration of terrorist organizations that could threaten U.S. interests beyond that region of the world. Uh, so I, I know that the U.S. government and the military intelligence services are looking at how to ensure that they have the ability to monitor developments there, but also to take appropriate action if, in fact, terrorists continue to try to use that area to launch attacks against U.S. interests. I think there's a broader issue as far as the Middle East as a whole is concerned. Uh, obviously, uh, a lot of eyes are looking at what's going on in Afghanistan right now and whether or not uh, there's going to be uh, a semblance of stability there or whether it's going to devolve into instability and more violence that could, in fact, spill over in other areas. Uh, so there are a lot of issues in the Middle East uh, that I know the Biden administration is looking carefully at. We don't know whether or not the Iran nuclear accord is going to mm -hmm. come back online anytime soon. But I do think that the pullout of the U.S. military from Afghanistan and now looking at what our presence is throughout the Middle East is something that I think we have to take stock of. It's, there's a new environment there. And then more broadly, what is it that we have to be thinking about in terms of how the world's eyes have looked upon our decision to pull out of Afghanistan, the very unfortunate footage of the last several weeks there, where there was a lot of chaos surrounding that withdrawal, and whether or not uh, some of our allies and partners, uh, as well as adversaries, are going to question whether or not the U.S. has the resolve to continue to make the commitments necessary to fulfill its global role in terms of the world leader, particularly of the Western free world. Uh, so I, I know that uh, the national security officials who are currently uh, in government are looking very carefully at, at all these various potential implications. But uh, I have confidence that uh, they will try to navigate uh, all of these issues um, and uh, uh, try to do their best to, again, protect U.S. national security interests, which I know was at the heart of President Biden's decision to pull out of Af Afghanistan. I guess, in short, could the withdrawal have been better? I, I think it, it, it could have and should have been better managed. I know President Biden doesn't like to hear that. Um, he came out very strongly uh, rebuking people who say that. But uh, there, there certainly was a momentum and there was a cascading effect uh, in terms of some decisions that were made. And then the collapse of the government and then the departure of President Ghani, I think, accelerated uh, some of these these timelines. But that said, I think we sh should have anticipated better that if you pull out U.S. military forces, uh, companion NATO forces, U.S. contractors and intelligence, you have taken away the bloodstream of the Afghan organs of government, security and military forces. And so once that bloodstream was cut off, uh, I think the, uh, the the body, the Afghan body politic itself uh, died pretty quickly. And I, I do think that we should have anticipated that better. Given the fallout that we've seen since then, what is the priority for the Biden administration in order to mitigate some of the side effects that that's led to, including, as you say, uh, some of the perception that allies might have gotten? 
Yeah, I think we have to make sure that we are in very close dialogue with the Pakistanis, uh, with the uh, Arab partners uh, in the region, uh, making sure that we continue to have a robust military presence that gives us the intelligence collection as well as strike capability that we need in the event that we see these terrorist groups uh, growing once again. Uh, so I, I do think that we need to make sure that the partners, allies, as well as adversaries in the area n know that they shouldn't draw too many um, mm -hmm. um, implications from this decision, that the United States is still resolute in its determination to fulfill its global responsibilities. And yes, uh, Afghan, uh, the Afghan withdrawal, I think, um, resulted in a an environment that was unfortunate, but uh, they shouldn't draw too many lessons from that, that the United States continues to be the world's leading superpower uh, on the military, political and economic front, and that we're going to continue to live up to those responsibilities. John, you, you touched on some of the regional potential implications looking to the Middle East. Um, I, I want to raise a related question around the, the the regional implications in South Asia, not just with back, Pakistan, but also with India. You know, the Indian prime minister visited last week, uh, had a meeting with President Biden uh, at the top of the agenda uh, as a result of the <clears throat> our departure from Afghanistan now for the Indians with us is regional security issues and the concerns around um, what Pakistan might do, but but possibly more significantly, what China might do. H how do you think about those regional dimensions, and particularly in today's environment, whether China may look to exploit the change in Afghanistan for geopolitical um, reasons vis-a-vis -vis India? Well, China is very clever at being able to exploit quite quickly uh, openings on the global stage that the result of either a, um, a change in U.S. or other policies. And the, 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 I think the Chinese government is interested most in being able to uh, develop those economic, um, commercial, business, trade, financial ties that are going to continue to fuel the Chinese engine. And so I am sure that the Chinese are looking uh, and are pursuing uh, opportunities that they ha might have with the new Taliban government. There's already been meetings there. Uh, and to see what they can do to ensure that they're going to have a very play a prominent role in the future of Afghanistan. Uh, so, it, And that's one of the reasons why I think that the Biden administration decided to withdraw from Afghanistan, because there are a lot of issues that the United States has to deal with, including this growing muscularity of China on the global stage throughout the South Asian region, as well as beyond. And so I think the Biden administration needs to take stock of the Chinese aggressiveness when it comes to continuing to push forward on many, many fronts, again, trying to exploit opportunities that result from either the reality or the perception of a U.S. change in uh, our in, in interests in these parts of the world. You have spent about three decades at the CIA. All of the changes that you've seen since then, how has the U.S. prepared to deal with the, with the rise of China? Especially when you look at the uh, the intelligence community, but also policy makers? Well, I was first at the White House and then at CIA during the Obama administration when the, the decision was made to make a pivot toward Asia. And so we tried to ensure that we were trying to redirect some of our intelligence capabilities and presence so that we would be able to have a better opportunity to monitor developments there and to counter any types of, of Chinese moves that were designed to undercut U.S. interests. But you know, the U.S. government and all of the various departments and agencies, it's a very large enterprise. And so moving that in the direction of the pivot to Asia, I think, took quite a bit of, of effort and time. And I can remember um, during that time when I was traveling through Europe, a lot of our European allies and partners were very concerned that the United States was going to move away from the traditional partnerships in the, uh, the transatlantic theater and then start concentrating on China. 
And so I had to try to reassure my counterparts and the leaders that I met with in Europe, no, the United States is still going to address its uh, interests as well as its partners and allies in Europe. But that doesn't mean that we're not going to increase our engagement in Asia, uh, particularly because China is on the rise. And China's rise does not just affect U.S. interests. It affects the interests of the global community. And it affects certainly European interests. And, and so I think there is a real balancing act the United States needs to engage in, not to uh, ignore or abandon its traditional areas of, of alliances and partnerships and, and economic and trade relationships, but at the same time to increase its the attention it pays to East Asia, because that is an area of, of tremendous ascendance in many respects in terms of the impact that it has uh, on that global environment. John, just to pick up on that, um, one in my mind, one of the most consequential developments over the, the recent past has been the dramatic change in the U.S.-India relationship. Um, but we're also seeing new patterns of behavior if I can describe it that way, by the Biden administration, um, I, I think driven in many ways by the set of challenges reflected by China. And, and first among those I would put right now is the security pact announced among the United States, Australia, and the UK. Just to push you a little bit, uh, as you look, as if you were back in government looking to the future what would be the kinds of new forms of cooperation, collaboration, behavior that you might advocate for, given the kind of challenge, and you know, some, some call generational challenge, that China is likely to present the United States? Well, I think it has to be multidimensional. Uh, in terms of our engagement. Uh, traditionally, we always try to strengthen the, the mil military to military relationship and also security cooperation, intelligence sharing, as well as on the economic front. But I also think that what we need to do, and we haven't done as good a job as I think we should have over the years, is to enhance those uh, relationships, ties, and contacts on the cultural front, on the scientific and technical front, on the medical front. Uh, obviously, the United States is the world's leader in many of these fields. And we need to take advantage of the ubiquitous U.S. influence that we have around the globe in some of these soft power areas. And so when I think about um, India, South Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, there is a real thirst, I think, for increased American attention, but also increased interest on the part of the populations there to interact with uh, Americans and Americana. Um, and that's why I think that we need to be thinking more about how we're going to use some of these strong attributes that we have, such as on the cultural front, to be able to strengthen and build bridges between countries. Uh, I've I long advocated that we needed to do that, uh, despite uh, when we were at the nadir of our relationship with Iran, for example, that we could have done better on the, on the cultural, on the sports, on the athletic, on the entertainment, on those other areas. Because I think if you build those bonds at the, at the grassroots level, it just gives birth to, I think, more positive potential in terms of how you're going to strengthen those other traditional bonds of friendship and partnership. Uh, just to get a, a bit wonky and bureaucratic, um, <laughs> but I can't, I can't help myself. Who does that, John? Who, who, would, who would you charge that with in the U.S. government? Well, I remember when I served overseas a number of years, uh, and that uh, even when I studied um, in Cairo years ago, when we would have the U.S. Information Agency, USIA, that would be sponsoring a lot of these U.S. notables uh, who would visit different countries and put on performances or interact. And so I, I do think this is one of the issues for the 21st century U.S. government, that um, a lot of our organizations and institutions were developed in the 18th and 19th mm -hmm. century. And we have to be thinking, I think, more progressively in terms of what does the 21st century environment look like? And how then can the U.S. government um, maybe re-engineer itself a bit so that we're not just going to be operating through the traditional military, economic, political channels, 
but there's a way for us to be able to tap into the very, very bountiful U.S. private sector, science, technology, entertainment, athletic, sports, culture, all of it, in order to help to um, advance U.S. interests globally uh, with the power of our, of our example and the power of what our society can do for, for others. Not to make them replicate mm-hmm. what we're doing, but to have them see the benefits of an open society like the United States, where liberties and, and privacy rights and, and freedoms are, are cherished. When it comes to the intelligence connection and the political connection between countries, how much of a difference do the quad meetings between India, Australia, the US, Japan, or this new AUKUS pact between the US, the UK, and Australia, how much of a difference uh, do those s- frameworks make for people on the ground, the intelligence analysts that get all of that information and try to come up with the big picture? Well, these types of initiatives, multilateral initiatives, I think the Quad is a good example, um, really helps to prompt the various institutions of, of government, uh, of the members, to follow up on their political leaders' initiative. And so it uh, would give birth to, let's say, intel meetings of the, of the Quad representatives and to talk about, okay, what can we do better? Uh, each of those four countries has have bilateral relationships uh, between them. But I think the whole purpose of multilateralism is to see what can be done in order to integrate capabilities and to more broadly sort of share, uh, whether it be information or uh, activities that are going to benefit the whole. So um, whether or not you're talking about the Quad or you're talking about, you know, place like NATO or ASEAN or other types of things, I think it provides a, a, a forum uh, as well as a framework for more interaction among countries that have similar objectives and goals. And certainly when I was at CIA, I always tried to use those multilateral fora in order to generate some additional interactions with my counterparts in various parts of the world. What happens if, like the new AUKUS pact, it upsets some of your existing allies, like what happened with the France sub deal. Um, <laughs> if you had to give President Biden a grade so far when it comes to foreign policy, what would it be? <laughs> That's a tough one, isn't it? <laughs> I'll make it pass fail. I'll put him pass. <laughs> uh, he, he inherited a, a, an array of, of really significant challenges. And He's been trying to navigate the shoals as best he can. Now, I, I didn't agree with all of the decisions he's made. Uh, I think there are some things that I certainly would have advised differently, but he's the president. Uh, and so I think this is, he's not even in, in office for a year. Uh, so we have another three plus years to really understand what the legacy of the, at least the first, first Biden administration will be. Uh, but I, I, I do think that uh, I agree with the general direction, although I am a bit concerned that uh, I was very much opposed to the mantra of the Trump administration, America first, America first, mm-hmm. because it conveys a message worldwide that the United States is going to use its tremendous advantages that it has to benefit itself, but potentially to disadvantage others. Um, that's certainly not what the Biden administration is saying. And I know that there needs to be focus domestically here in the United States in order to build back better. But at the same time, we cannot forget that the United States, certainly for the last 75 years, has had a very prominent role in global affairs. And uh, sometimes that takes a a fair amount of of investment and and effort and even sacrifice and commitments. And so I I am hoping that uh, the Biden administration will see that um, the the prospects for global peace, stability, and security really rest, I think, in large measure on the shoulders of the U.S. government and, and how it um, engages uh, with the worldwide community, spanning the spectrum from our allies and partners all the way to our, uh, our adversaries. Uh, so, again, I think uh, Joe Biden, President Biden, has years and years of experience, and I'm hoping that he's going to continue to tap that experience in order to uh, determine exactly the, the best course of action. John, the, you know and are steeped in the role of 
intelligence in combating terrorism, extremism, more than almost anyone that I can think of. Uh, You led the CIA for four years, and the shift we face now has been away from counterterrorism to, as, as many people have talked about, the geopolitical competition with China. How does that change the priorities for the CIA in terms of orientation and the role it plays when you have a competition that spans years, um, often doesn't come to a specific head in terms of a threat? Um, what, What would you characterize as the biggest adjustments and changes that need to be made by our intelligence community. And at the heart of it uh, is the CIA. Well, I think thinking about the the transition from the Trump administration to the Biden administration, uh, there has been a lot of continuity uh, as as well there should be. Um, Mm -hmm. Obviously, China and Russia are big concerns. Counterterrorism continues, Middle East. Now, each administration and president will have his or her own uh, set of priorities. And at the beginning of each administration, uh, that the new president will set out those priorities. And then there is the interagency process that the intelligence community participates in that then gives birth to something called the National Intelligence Priorities Framework, which is how the intelligence agencies, the collection, the analytic capabilities, and so on, how they're going to prioritize the um, the issues so that it has uh, the ability to support policymaker priorities. And so I think there has been some calibration done as a result of what the new Biden administration is, is saying. But China has always has long been a concern for the intelligence community. Russia, you know, all of these issues. Uh, and so I think you'll see some of the things going up or down. There are strategic uh, collection initiatives. There are tactical uh, collection capabilities. There is the amount of resources, analytic resources that are dedicated to different issues. And so I think there is some adjustments being made there, but it's not like a wholesale change uh, that you know you would see if there was a major war or like the attacks of 9-11. That led to quite a disruption of of mm-hmm. that, you know, uh, intelligence as well as military and diplomatic effort, there needs to be a redirection, and so I think the Biden administration is trying to ensure that there's going to be the proper balance because you cannot neglect a lot of these issues. I, I think that's one of the things in the past that we've learned lessons. You mm-hmm. can't turn your attention away from one issue just because it's not as prominent as it might have been in the past. Uh, you need to adjust maybe the resources you dedicate to it. But uh, the United States is unique in that it has interests throughout the the, the globe. And its interests are not just uh, commercial or business or economic like China might have in some areas of the world. We really have an an interest in humanitarian issues, in democratic values, uh, in economic development, uh, in stability, in counterterrorism. And so there needs to be that investment made in each one of these areas across the global landscape. And so I I do think that, again, there's a recalibration in light of the Biden administration's priorities, but I don't believe it is a a major uh, redirection at all. Let me just ask one follow-up, John. As you look out into the future, is the role of human intelligence more or less important? (laughs) Yeah. Well, I think it's as certainly as important. Um, the tremendous advancement in technological developments around the world has has made human espionage more challenging in some respects mm-hmm. because there are a lot of counterintelligence capabilities that countries have around the globe. At the same time, you can use technology to your advantage. And I think the key for 21st century intelligence organizations is to integrate your human source capabilities with your technical capabilities, with your analytic capabilities, with your open source information, uh, and to integrate that so that you can really devote your very precious, sensitive human sources to go against those issues and those secrets that are not discoverable by other means. 
And so I think what you want to do is to preserve those human capabilities to go after the most important uh, topics and issues and, and mysteries that are out there, secrets, um, but take full advantage of the other avenues. But frequently, you need to combine it because the best human operations that I'm aware of are the ones that were enabled by other capabilities, again, whether they be technical, scientific, mm. um, uh, all analytic. Uh, again, they could be force multipliers, but I, I do think human intelligence capabilities, espionage, will always be part of that intelligence toolkit. When it comes to China, what does the intelligence community believe is one of the key threats posed by the country, whether it's military or cyber crimes? And what are the most um, widely used collection methods when it comes to uh, China uh, as a subject? <laughs> well, China poses a really, really difficult uh, intelligence challenge. Uh, to uh, certainly U.S. Uh, intelligence community. Uh, so big and large, they have a global presence uh, in terms of people around the globe that the Chinese government and intelligence security services tap on a regular basis to be able to penetrate and infiltrate uh, their targets, be able to steal intellectual property, to be able to steal national security secrets, to be able to um, find opportunities in, in governments and organizations worldwide, to be able to um, develop sources and to uh, basically en enhance the opportunities for the Chinese to advance their interests. And, and so um, the Chinese obviously are very, very adept and have a voracious appetite in the cyber realm. And they've taken full advantage of the digital uh, environment, the digital domain, in order to ply their trade globally. Uh, so uh, I, I do think that um, China's economic heft, uh, its, its growing military muscle, certainly in the, the Western Pacific, uh, Southeast Asia, um, as well as their commercial and trade interests, uh, the One Belt, One Road going across South Asia into Africa, uh, they are all over, uh, and they seem to have no lack of resources, people, money, um, assistance, aid, you name it, that, that they can tap uh, at any time. So uh, the U.S. intelligence community, again, working with a lot of our partners around the world, because as good as the CIA and other U.S. intelligence agencies are, we rely heavily on others to be able to augment our capabilities, particularly since we have a shared perspective in terms of the nature of the Chinese threat. Uh, so uh, again, I think it, it runs the gamut um, um, from the scientific, technical, to the digital, to the military, economic, uh, you name it. John, I couldn't agree with you more when you commented on the criticality of our allies and partners. Um, and I think the, the question of China uh, emphasizes that um, even more in spades. I, I'm, I'm curious, you know, we've, as I mentioned before, we've watched the US India relationship in many respects, uh, blossom over the last couple decades. Is there another partnership that the United States has around the world that could be the next US India relationship? <laughs> well, there are not too many countries on the world that have, uh, India's size, as well right. as uh, Indians, India's diaspora, including the United States, uh, and their scientific and technical community, obviously, is, is very, very advanced. Uh, but when I think about uh, Asia in particular, uh, I think about South Korea, I think about Japan, I think about you know, Vietnam, uh, a number of countries that uh, I think are developing and have developed very close you know, ties to the United States uh, across the, the spectrum of, of uh, um, arenas. Uh, so um, Africa, I think, is still going to be a, a major, major area of uh, interest, as well as global competition, as well as potential instability uh, in the, the decades ahead that the United States needs to be able to address. And uh, I know that China is making inroads there um, as the um, their 
their perspective is that the United States maybe has pulled back a bit. We we shouldn't pull back in Africa because I think it is a a very very uh, critical, important uh, geostrategic part of the world. But uh, yeah, there there are a, a number of countries out there where I, I think the relationship with the United States is critically important, particularly for those who feel the the breath, uh, the Chinese breath on their neck. Uh, think about Indonesia. Think about Malaysia. Uh, these are are countries that really I think expect the United States to provide a counterweight to that Chinese influence. Um, that's why I, I, I traveled out to Asia a number of times at the end of the Obama administration, and uh, a lot of the counterparts that I met with and government officials were really very interested in, in seeing the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, mm-hmm. come into force because they wanted to have that counterweight uh, to China. And so I, I do think we have to be looking at these countries individually, but at the same time, I think we have to look at them as part of a collective uh, that really, uh, some of them are small, but they do really do look to the United States to be able to protect them from that overbearing, I think, very, very aggressive uh, Chinese uh, posture that uh, they cannot uh, withstand on their own. John, thank you so much. R- very grateful for you to join us today for our conversation. We covered a fair amount of the waterfront here um, uh, around foreign policy, national security, intelligence, um, and uh, uh, just loved hearing your insights. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Rex and Sherry. Really enjoyed being with you today and best wishes with your podcast. And uh, obviously you're focusing on a part of the world that is only going to grow in importance as well as in global attention. So again, uh, good on you for what you're doing. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for your insights. And thank you to our listeners. Please be sure to rate us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also access the full video of our conversation at theasiagroup.com. We'll see you next time on Tea Leaves.